coming up, we can't be in Oshkosh, but we have some great things for you. We've been looking back at our air venture coverage from the past decade or so and found some really awesome stories for you. And we have a lot of great memories from uh, Air Ventures past, and we're really excited to, to share them and talk about them some more. So AOPA Live, the Oshkosh edition, begins in just a moment. Lightspeed Zulu 3, the most preferred, most awarded headset in general aviation. With decades of providing unsurpassed value and unsurpassed functionality, pilots all over the world love flying with Zulu 3. Try Zulu 3 today, risk-free, with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Lightspeed, fly with Zulu. This is AOPA Live This Week. Well, it, the big disappointment for all of us, this week we would normally be in Oshkosh with all of you and all of our friends, but thanks to COVID, we're here in Frederick, scattered and socially isolating. But uh, we have a few things to share with you this week. Yeah, so it's cool to hang out here on Skype. Josh, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well, um, you know. Definitely ready to uh, leave home some more, but I've enjoyed some extra time here too. So, but it's uh, good to look back on on the days when we were out at Oshkosh for sure. Yeah, and one of the great things about Oshkosh is all of the unique aircraft you get to see there. Some with incredible performance, and this is one which the performance was just absolutely insane, <laughs> and that was Draco. It looks like a bird of prey that's about to swoop down for the kill. This one-time Wilga turned into a short takeoff and landing champion by seasoned backcountry pilot Mike Patey. From piston-powered to turboprop Pratt PT-6, he transformed WIMP to WOW. The conversion from 250 to 680 horsepower giving him, for all intents and purposes, a one-to-one -one thrust to weight ratio. To say he modified the airframe, an understatement. We changed the wing. I made it my own airfoil, um, added 35 square feet of wing area, changed the flaps, made them bigger, changed the ailerons, made them bigger depth and length. Like his plane, Mike's story is really pretty unique. He and his twin brother are successful serial entrepreneurs. They own Best Tugs and a company that does environmental cleanup, mostly for the oil industry. But they got bit by the aviation bug at the same time. It was one of those bizarre twin moments. My brother and I had never talked about flying. I jumped in a plane with my father-in-law, who's a pilot, my mother-in-law is a pilot. We flew to an air show, I'd never been to one. And I got there and all day, all I could think is, I, I think I wanna get my license. Randomly, he called me that day and said, Mike, I'm so excited. I've been thinking about something all day and you won't believe what it is. And I said, no, no, wait, I got to tell you what I want to do. And he goes, no, I'm first. I'm like, okay, go ahead. He had no idea I had gone to an air show. No clue. And he said, Mike, I would wanted to go to work. And I thought, you know what? I'm just, I, maybe I should learn to fly. And he says, I kept thinking about it. So during lunch, I ran to the local airport and I found a guy who's an instructor and he, he can teach us how to fly. And there's a plane here, I think we should buy it. It's a Cessna 172, let's get our license. And I said, you kidding me? Do it. Today, they share campsites at Oshkosh. While Mike flew in, in Draco, his wife and their boys made the motor coach trek from Utah. Tooling around this temporary town, they share their passion for flight. They also share memories only backcountry flying can help make real. Kind of hard to explain. It's just something you have to experience. We go to a bunch of places that don't have roads. So that's, I mean, that's already a big one. We go out to these huge open fields next to some mountains. And, you know, now, now we're camping there. We got a plane, so. <laughs> it's amazing what happens when you get your pilot's license. The world becomes a lot smaller and you can access a lot uh, more spaces than you used to be able to, and a lot faster. And so it's been, it's been really nice for our family um, as a bonding thing too. And there's so many different things with aviation, so many different um, platforms in aviation. The Draco is just one of several aircraft that Mike owns, including a helicopter, a jet, and a Lancer legacy with which he set several land speed records. Haiti and Turbulence hold transcontinental and close course records, but it's his latest trophy, winning the heavy class short takeoff and landing competition at AirVenture that made all those sleepless nights, though normal for him, quite fulfilling. I tend to not sleep much. I've never really needed a lot of sleep. 
so um, I'll spend time with my family, with my work, and then I'll go down and, uh, and spend eight, 10 hours on, on my plane, and on weekends I'll spend 20 to 22 hours a day. And uh, I usually only need three or four hours sleep a night max, and I can do two and three days straight without sleep, and so I've always been that way, I don't know why, <laughs> and it works for me because I can knock out a plane like this in five months, so this was a five month build for me. So you run hard and fly slow. Right. Yes, <laughs> and occasionally fast. <laughs> Paul Moses, AOPA Live. Yes, sadly Draco crashed, but uh, our friends out there in Utah are working on a new critter. Yeah, it'll be rebuilt. It'll be bigger and better than, than ever, and, and knowing the Pades, it'll be done in another, you know, six weeks or so. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing, uh, I think they're calling it Scrappy, um, whenever it's done, hopefully at AirVenture coming up in another year in the future. Well, one of the things that I think uh, is important if you've ever camped at AirVenture is to uh, have some coffee in the morning. And Warren, I don't even know if you remember this, but back in 2011, you shot a story that we aired in 2012 on folks getting their morning coffee and, and camping at Oshkosh. Well, indeed, you know, I mean, the, the campgrounds are just incredible at Oshkosh. And, you know, I, for one, can't even begin a day without my coffee. Same here. It's morning in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and the sunrise brings sleepy campers out to meet the day. Of course, when the campers are pilots, a good cup of joe is an absolute necessity. Today we got here at 6 o'clock, it's the Flying High Coffee, and I have 10 gallons of coffee and it'll all be gone in about 30 minutes. Now everybody's up and alive and going after the coffee. So, you know. well, the most important thing around here is coffee in the morning. Uh, fuel trucks come really late in the afternoon. Oh, you gotta start 25 times this way, 25 times that way. <laughs> but it's more than the coffee that keeps these folks coming back year after year. This is the home built camping area. And so everyone has a personal involvement with their airplane. In my own case, it took me 12 years to put this airplane together. And to share that experience with all the folks that are here with a cup of coffee in the morning is wonderful. People come up here because everybody up here loves their airplanes, loves being around other people that love their airplanes. You can talk to anybody. You know, we all have a common denominator. I think it's a camaraderie with our fellow builders and uh, just the people and uh, the whole atmosphere. I absolutely love it. Getting up here and seeing the people with similar interests, it's fantastic. But the skies over Oshkosh aren't always clear. Every year, there's one day like this that you get rained out. I've been here when you had to hang onto your tent and just hope like heck you didn't go with the tent. So it happens once every year, and it's just part of the whole process. Like everybody's saying, maybe in about an hour, this stuff will pass by. And we'll be... After only 20 minutes, the weather broke and the sun returned. The rain was very loud and then the wind would catch a tent and blow it around like this and I thought, oh my goodness gracious, this is, this is camping, oh boy. <laughs> camping at Oshkosh is an experience in itself. This is my first time camping, so I bought this tent just, for the re just because it was inexpensive, figuring if this didn't work out, I'm going to throw it away when I'm done. And uh, this morning when it rained, it was uh, pretty exciting because I don't really ever recall being in a tent in a thunderstorm. I'm kind of now a little bit seasoned. I'm, I have one day, one day, I'm not a virgin camper anymore. I'm becoming a seasoned camper. So it's been a wonderful experience all the way around, quite an adventure. I mean, it would be nice to be in the Hilton, but we were talking last night that, that it's, you can't really experience that until you're here camping underneath your wing. At AirVenture, Warren Morningstar, AOPA Live. So obviously at, at Oshkosh, there are all kinds of really amazing airplanes, um, but um, I saw one a Mini B-17 that got a, a lot of attention a couple years ago that was probably one of the more incredible ones I've seen, just the attention to detail. And uh, it, a lot of people came and looked at it and it truly was an amazing. And the people, the uh, guy that built it, Jack Bally, was um, amazing too, so. When Jack Bally told his friends he was going to build a one-third scale B-17, they didn't believe he could do it. 
But you can't build that. You ain't smart enough, you SOB, you know? Well, he sure proved them wrong. It may have taken 17 years, but Bally brought his bomber to Air Venture this year. It took thousands of hours to build. Bally took the designs from a smaller RC B-17 and scaled them up. He used four Heath engines to power the airplane, and everything is to scale except the pilot. Bally ran into a number of design challenges along the way, but he never gave up. It was a lot of years of a lot of fun. It, I never wanted to quit. And for pilot Richard Cozy, Bally's bomber is rewarding to fly. It was a highlight of my career, you know, I got 16,000 hours in the sky, flew in Alaska 11 years, I got 6,000 hours of Alaska time, I'm flying four engine jets all over the world, and, and twin beaches, you know, this is a nice little airplane, it's a, it's a happy little airplane, it, it has little roll characteristics through the air, but everybody thinks I'm waving at them, and I just say it's a happy little bomber flying through the air, so. And the airplane has received a huge response from the public, it is especially meaningful for veterans who served in the B-17. On the wall of his workshop, he had a picture of Keith Ferris's painting, Fortresses Under Fire. As in the early parts of the build, he had B-17, or former B-17 pilots that actually come in and visit. But as they scanned, they would see that picture. And many times they would come back with tears in their eyes after a couple minutes, wiping the tears away saying, that's the way it really was. And they heard of this being built. And to find a real one, to be able to walk around a real one is very difficult, very few of them around. And they were able to come and sit down and talk about this one. And so it opened up memories from the past that they had brought back just by seeing this airplane. And even for visitors without a personal connection to the B-17, the project is inspiring such an iconic part of history. Uh, in fact, my kids and I have been building a plastic model of a B-17, uh, oddly enough, before we came here. And, and I've been telling them stories about it and about World War II aviation in general. And it seems like we, we do keep coming back to the, the B-17 and the European theater and the little friends, you know, and my kids know about the P-51s and what they did. And uh, just the whole thing makes a fascinating story. You really see a goal and and then you see this. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely inspiring to where you can accomplish anything you want to do. Josh Cochran, AOPA Live. Yeah, Josh, that has got to be one of the coolest stories we've ever done. I mean, the amount of work the man put into building a scale model B-17 that flies. That's the thing. It flies with a human <laughs> being in it. I thought it was remote control when you first told me about the story. And it's like, there's a person flying this scale model. That is just so incredible. It just... What a, what a feat of ingenuity. Yeah, it, it, it really was. You know, Oshkosh, Air Venture, and, you know, our, our apologies to our friends at EAA, but, you know, they, they re renamed it Air Venture, but to uh, us awesome. who's been around for a long time, it's always going to be Oshkosh. But, you know, it, it, Air Venture is, is really a family affair. You see all kinds of families there, multiple generations. And uh, we went out and found a whole bunch of families one year here at Oshkosh. Sam Scaletta is doing all he can to pass along his love of aviation. Wandering the warbirds with his son Michael and grandson Jackson, he proudly shares a passion passed down by his father-in-law who flew in World War II. It's always fun. Uh, we really like the warbirds, the classics. And then also it's always fun to find what's new and innovative. I really enjoy the Warbirds and the classics. There's nothing like the uh, the AT-6, the P-51s, the Corsairs, the Bearcats, the Tiger Cats, all of those classic war World War II fighters, uh, the pist large piston engine fighters is what really got me excited and still does to this day. And Generation 3, Jackson, he's only 12 but already has his eyes to the sky. I do Civil Air Patrol at our an local Anderson Squadron where we'll go in and they'll teach us about airplanes and they have a 182 that they fly and then we'll get to learn like drill and we get to wear Air Force ABU uniform so it's a lot of fun. Be it camping under a wing or at the local Holiday Inn, year after year, they come. The Nordbees have been coming here together for 35 years. We found them camping by their Dakota. Now it's a fine family tradition. We started coming before he bought his first airplane, and I knew that it was something important to him. And 
airplanes. So we started coming and I kind of got hooked on just the airplanes themselves. You, you talk to pilots and you get information uh, and, and you find out what they enjoy doing. And, and, uh, and I think that's, it gets to be more about talking to people and, uh, and, and your camping mates here uh, yeah. on the grounds. And, uh, yeah. It almost gets to be that's what it's almost about more the pilots more than the planes after a while. The Nordby's daughter Jennifer has been coming to Oshkosh her entire life. Can she imagine her life without making the annual pilgrimage? No, definitely not since it's a big part of my life um, and this whole trip again this is like the one trip we take every single year of our yeah. life so. So when you're married and have grandbabies are they coming to Oshkosh? Definitely yes definitely. <laughs> I'm hoping to get my pilot's license and then be able to take my family here. That will make three generations for the Nordbees as well, although it will likely have to wait until after medical school. Jennifer Nahn, AOPA Live. What a great story. I mean, what an incredible thing to have multiple generations gather and bond. And I think, you know, being stuck in a tent with your family or even in the airplane on the way there has <laughs> got to make you closer to them, whether you want it to or not. <laughs> yeah, we mentioned the Pateys earlier, and they, and they always come as a family, too. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and families coming. Uh, I think we have a story about a 14-year-old a that flew a glider across the country to AirVenture, and her dad flew behind her. Um, so Jill Tolman uh, told that story. Is this your first time at Oshkosh? I've been now six years straight, so seven total. But this year you're kind of a celebrity. You turned 14 this year and you did something really cool. Tell us what you did. Uh, I flew a motor glider uh, from Monterey, California to uh, Maine solo. First I kind of learned that you could solo a glider at 14, two years younger than you solo a normal power plane. But then I was like, wait, couldn't I solo a uh, motor glider at 14? We're like, can I solo it across the country? And we're like, yeah, and then that'd be a good opportunity to promote youth in aviation. How many days? So nine days of flying, about three hours each day in the morning. And the last day we had a 40 knot tailwind, so we kind of combined them because it was going to take us 10 days. So then we just took a quick fuel stop in Pennsylvania and flew a three hour leg and flew a two hour leg. She was flying solo, but it turns out she wasn't alone. Her and I and a friend of mine, uh, we had uh, two other airplanes besides her uh, glider and then I kind of did a racetrack right behind her in, in the Barrens. So that was kind of a bit of work to kind of uh, keep in a position. We all just chatted the entire time about, you know, how her glider's running, how she's feeling, sightseeing along the ground. It's fun and it's great with ADS-B now, so she can see me uh, on her iPad and I can see her on, on my avionics. How did it feel when you landed in Maine? It was really exciting, especially, um, like, especially like 10 minutes before I landed because I truly went across the coast because we live right by the coast in um, California. So I went out, flew over the Pacific, just got both wheels over, uh, did a 180, reversed my course, and then uh, at Maine I went out over the Atlantic, out over the coast. And so that was like truly coast to coast, so that was exciting. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Jill Tolman, AOPA Live. Yeah, well, congrats to her. That was a really an epic flight, and I know Dad was really proud of it, too. Yeah, I I don't know many adults that have flown truly ocean to ocean, and to do it at 14, like I can't wait to see what this young lady's going to do in life if she's got that kind of start to it already. But you know, a lot of people have done some pretty incredible things in aviation, and foremost among them, uh, it's got to be Paul Poveresny, who got EAA started. And uh, I had uh, the incredible honor of uh, getting to go in to his workshop. You know, they have the aeroplane factory there that people can walk through. It's kind of, you know, going out towards the, the home build area. But, but his real workshop is over kind of tucked away in some trees. And, and the year after he passed, I, I had some privileged access to go in there and, and video it. And it was just, uh, just very haunting. And it, you'll see the video here in this piece about uh, the last airplane he ever worked on, showing up to the first air venture after he had passed. The crowds may have been bigger this year, but air venture has never felt so empty. It's the first Oshkosh without aviation's elder statesman tooling around in his familiar red VW, greeting anyone he could with a smile. I mean, I know he's still with us in spirit, but to not see red one driving around is, is definitely, there's a gap there. Air Venture is so big, you can't really take it all in. All of the people, all of the spectacle, all of the grandeur can all be traced back to one simple parasol-winged airplane. 
In 1955, the Experimental Aircraft Association was a tiny group with Paul Poboresny at the helm. He was ever the PR man, so he took the opportunity to write a series of articles for Mechanics Illustrated, a how-to publication. He would detail how to build a baby ace in your own home for less than $800, engine included. It really convinced a lot of people to uh, build aircraft. In the optimistic post-war America, the May, June, and July series resonated. Within three days of the publication, more than 100 letters poured in. And suddenly he was inundated with, with mail to his home because he was running the EAA out of his, basically out of his basement at that time. And uh, he literally told me he had to go out and buy a larger mailbox just so that the post office could deliver all the letters from around the world of people interested in this idea of building your own aircraft. The article's success built EAA from the home base builders group to the international organization that it is today. Paul would go on to live every aviator's wildest dreams, piloting just about everything that would fly and building airplanes his entire life. Flash forward to 2011. Paul's humble aeroplane factory, tucked away inside a red barn on the EAA grounds, was yet again teeming with a new project. It would be a replica of the Mechanics Illustrated Baby Ace. Paul brushed off the old plans and started teaching a new generation how it's done. I didn't know what to expect when I first showed up on my first Saturday when we were starting construction of the fuselage. Um, I wasn't sure if Paul would just show up. I mean, he was in his late 80s at the time, and I wasn't sure if he'd just show up, give us a few hints, and then disappear while we did all the work. But uh, he stayed there all day long, and we worked Saturdays and some Sundays pretty much all throughout the winter uh, building the fuselage. It was an amazing experience. He, he always had that can-do attitude. Kurt Meir had been working on airplanes with Paul since the early 90s. He was excited to roll up his sleeves with him again. Charlie Becker was new to home building, but helped out with the back-to-basics build. It wasn't until I volunteered to help him on the Baby Ace project that I really felt like I got to know him really well on a really personal level. Charlie's dad had recently passed and he found an adoptive paternal figure in sport aviation's living legend. It was just great to have the, the founder of EAA showing you how to cut tubing on a baby ace and you know, how, you know how to put the tubings in place and you know showing you the ropes. He was in the master's workshop where all were welcome and Paul shared his knowledge freely. He knew that everyone had something to contribute and he knew how to bring that out of people and that's something that I have taken away from my time with him. The build continued then one day in August 2013 Paul Poboresny flew west. Paul's family knew how significant the baby ace replica was and wanted Kurt to see the project through. I felt very honored that they, they would put that responsibility on me and I, I took it very seriously. Kurt's home EAA chapter 640 decided to finish the last airplane Paul ever started. We wanted to keep the uh, idea of the aeroplane factory alive and uh, so what we did was invite the general public in and any anybody with an interest in aviation uh, to come in and work on the project uh, as a tribute to Paul and keeping alive the spirit of the, of the aeroplane factory. They kept plugging away until it became a race to beat the clock. It came right down to the wire and guys put into a lot of sleepless nights to get it finished. Then in this spirit of aviation, the community rallied and the airplane was finished just days before Air Venture 2014. The first time I flew it, uh, I definitely felt a presence in the cockpit. It was, you know, it was an emotional time then. The last airplane Paul Poboresny built, a replica of the airplane that made EAA what it is today, flew some of its first hours to the first air venture without the man who started it all. Just seeing it land here was, uh, was quite emotional for me. Out of humble beginnings, Paul Poboresny grew to become one of a kind. He once said he ended up being a millionaire because he has a million friends, most of whom came to know Paul through Oshkosh. The one thing that I learned from Paul more than anything else is Paul loved people. And it didn't matter if you were somebody important or not. It didn't matter what your day job was. If you loved airplanes, Paul loved you. All those connections, all those lives touched, all because of one, now two, 
Little Red Airplanes. In Oshkosh, Paul Harrop, AOPA Live. Well, you know, you can find just about anything at AirVenture. Uh, some things you can only find at AirVenture. And a few years back, our Paul Moses found the one-man band you just will not believe. Time and technology have a way of catching up and even passing most of us, but not 83-year-old Jerry Slagers. And that's a good thing. You see, Jerry is a -a one-of-a-kind, one-man band. He doesn't need all the fancy whiz-bang technology to deliver his floor-slipping, ceiling-kicking polkas and waltzes. You see the people go out dancing in the ash all over there. He does a great job. He's an inventive guy. He's a musical genius. He's just a part of the heart and soul of this show. Jerry holds down his corner of Air Venture by giving flight to the soul. He's been doing so for 28 years with the most eclectic collection of chords and connections that make beautiful music to the ear. I've been coming up here since 1982, and I think I've seen him every year he's been here, and this is one reason I show up, (laughs) just to see him. It was Paul Poberezny himself who first brought him here, and he's been coming back ever since, turning down Leno, his former farmers built gadgets galore with this plethora of parts that might make all others wince. That's the keyboard activated on the bottom. Uh-huh. And then uh, I got a module here that operates the voices. The other one here, I got the trumpet. The other one is a tuba. The other one is a... You don't find polka one-man bands anywhere. This is it. This is part of Oshkosh. This is Wisconsin. You can't help but smile because Jerry is providing a real piece of Americana. And even after he's gone and no longer here at Oshkosh every year, and we all hope that's years down the road, his music will live on because he's got cassettes. And over time, he's moved into CDs. If you tell people what you see here, they don't believe it. He needs a video. You can buy the CDs, but it doesn't come close to describing the equipment and the amount of time and effort and so forth that you put into this. And when I'm done with this, it's got to go in the dump because nobody will be able to put this together. Plug it in wrong, it's just going to smoke. Literally. <laughs> and did he tell you, you know, he's got a ramp built. He loads it in the back of the van. He don't even take it apart because he probably couldn't figure it out himself. <laughs> it's great. And the people that watch him get a lot of enjoyment, don't Everybody they? here claps their hands, stamps their feet. It's just great. It's, it's super. I love it. I'll miss him. Miss him because Jerry says this will likely be his final year. His backups have bounced to the beat in time with his feet. It just can't go on forever. Although we all wish it could. A lot of people tell me all the stuff that I have here, I can do with one keyboard. And that's true. But what would people view? What do you want people to remember about you as the years go by? They'll do it with them CDs. <laughs> yeah. Live forever. Yeah. Paul Moses, AOPA Live. Hey, alrighty, okay. Well, sadly, Jerry's one-man band no longer is at Oshkosh, but uh, what a great piece that Paul Moses put together. And we talked earlier about family. Just want to mention that we're missing our own little family of people that come into crew AOPA Live uh, every year. So a shout out to our friends who aren't there and particularly to Paul Moses. Happy birthday, Paul. Happy birthday, Paul. And talk about somebody I learned more from than anyone else. Paul Moses, excellent storyteller. Missing everybody this week. Well, when we come back, we'll have more from the past decade or so at AirVenture. We've dug deep and we can't wait to share the rest of them with you. We'll be right back. Your plane is a valuable tool. With the Genesis Aerosystems S Tech 3100 Digital Autopilot, you can rest assured you will arrive safely to your destination. The 3100 is the industry's most advanced autopilot for single and twin engine aircraft providing exceptional workload reduction, safety enhancing capabilities such as straight and level mode and speed protection. To learn more, visit our website today. 
Well, welcome back to our retrospective look at uh, Oshkosh Air Venture, since we're all stuck here and we can't be there just like, like the rest of you. You know, um, during the one week of Air Venture, uh, Whitman Field is the busiest airport in the world. Uh, if you've ever flown the Fisk arrival, you have a pretty good idea of how crazy it is. But then once you get all those airplanes on the ground, they still have to be marshaled. And it, that's done with an incredible crew of volunteers. Attention on the orange net, there's Flightline Ops. The air show waiver today is active from 2.30 to 6.30. So about one hour and a half from now, we're gonna be closing for the air show. They're coming and going. taking off and landing. Over 22,000 operations during the week. With all the movement, it takes hundreds of volunteers to staff the flight line at AirVenture. Flightline operations, we've got a little over 200 of our own volunteers and also working with us are about 150 Civil Air Patrol. Uh, we're responsible for largely moving the airplanes around the taxiways. The tower controllers get them uh, onto the runway when they're landing and as soon as they roll off our volunteers take them. So we've got miles and miles of airplanes that we park as well as moving people around the taxiways. From modern jets to the vintage radiance. The flight line's main job is to move the airplanes safely. Out here on, on flight line operations at any given moment in time we have approximately 30 volunteers working just traffic operations. We have probably have another 20 working parking and camping right now. But my job is to keep them all safe. This is what we call an alpha crossing. We have to get them across this east-west uh, major, major arrival uh, runway. So the crew here is to stage the aircraft to come across. We're on scooters, we're parking airplanes, and you're, you're signaling you know, $300,000 worth of equipment within about two feet of each other, and that can be kind of a scary thing. And are we rolling north or rolling south off of the runway? We're rolling north. Rolling north. This is a well-oiled machine here. Okay, We've worked at this for years to make it the way it is now. It's the excitement of Oshkosh that keeps this dedicated crew coming back. Taxi after taxi, and year after year. Uh, we are a big family. Everybody knows everybody else, um, and people, come back every year. I really feel like I've grown up here. People like working here. At AirVenture, Warren Morningstar, AOBA Live. One of the amazing things that happens every year at Oshkosh is something called Women Soar, You Soar. Uh, it's a bunch of uh, girls and women uh, get together to uh, learn about aviation and um, they get to have some mentorship opportunities. Usually there's um, at least one Women Air Force Service pilot there every year. And uh, so here's a story about the girls learning about aviation and uh, mentorship from the Women Air Force Service pilots. I'm with the Women's Store You Store group for high school age girls. It's a program to show girls what all there is for women for aviation and broaden our horizons and really just inspire us. It's just a fabulous program. We educate and inspire these girls with women that are professionals in all areas of aviation. It was the hardest thing I ever did. But, you know, when I came out, I loved night flying, I loved instrument flying, and I especially loved aerobatic flying. Meeting the WASP and hearing them speak is so inspiring. When I was growing up, you didn't very often do anything extraordinary. You just had to kind of get married, have children, and then be a housewife. And I said, no, I really have made up my mind. I just want to get involved in the war service. Hearing them at a time when most people did not think women could fly and they still were able to get through and show everyone that they could and they could do anything. It's really inspirational for me to hear that and want to follow in their footsteps. And just seeing those folks who have gone before, that means for women and girls, there's such a scope and spectrum of what's available, what you can do and what you can achieve. But if we don't do something to encourage and inspire and pass on the passion for aviation, it will die. 
Being a woman in aviation, there are a lot more scholarship opportunities because we are a minority, so there's more of a push for us to become pilots and engineers and just get involved in aviation. You dream whatever you want to dream, but you go after it and stay after it until it happens because it does happen. We want people to love aviation. It's been so good to me. I want to have others enjoy it just a fraction of what I have. I think that any girl who wants to fly can make it happen. It is definitely attainable. There are so many ways to find ways to fly. You can make it happen, for sure. Yeah, we should never forget the great service that the women air service pilots did during World War II. And uh, recently, they were honored by being allowed to uh, go into Arlington National Cemetery, which was an honor that they deserved for a very long time. Absolutely. So one of the coolest places at Oshkosh is not on the Air Venture grounds. you got to get on a bus and ride about 20 minutes around, and you walk down this trail, and suddenly you're at this little slice of heaven called the Seaplane Base. And uh, our own Ian Twombly went over there and checked it out for us a few years back. Believe it or not, we are still in Oshkosh. Welcome to the Seaplane Base. This is the best kept secret of the air show. We just love it here. It's so peaceful. We don't hear anybody on the PA system going, well, there's John, he's doing an Emelman and a Salam Shabak, and well, look at that, he's backing up into the smoke. You don't hear that out here. For Tobo pilot and volunteer Bill Barnes, this quiet lake, just a 20 minute drive from Whitman Field, is home, at least for one week of the year. For him, helping out at the seaplane base is part family vacation and annual reunion all in one. He's been welcoming pilots and their beavers, cubs, and Cessnas on floats for more than 20 years. There are just a lot more of them these days. More than a hundred at times, each moored in this quiet cove off Lake Winnebago. Underneath each one of those balls is a concrete square about this big that has a hook right in the middle of it so that when the airplane pulls on it, it tries to tip it up and digs it into the muck. And we fasten that to the propeller so that when the wind comes around, the weather vanes into the wind, pushes it back, that pulls it down, and it develops negative lift and holds it on the water. All week, they come and they go, and given the chance, I took a spin in what some call a wet bike with wings, a Sea Ray Light Sport Amphib. Because of what it is, it's a very stable, a gentle airplane, it's forgiving, it's very good for beginner pilots too. It has incredible performance capabilities. Not to mention we're, you know, eight inches from the water, and uh, we've got pant legs rolled up, yep. feet wet coming in, so it's, it's what seaplane flying is all about. Clear! Almost immediately, we're on the step, and eventually skybound. So we tried to stall it. Yep. We tried to accelerate stall it, and uh, none of those really worked too well. I don't think. No, only in a power down stall, and then we get an initial stall, and you can hold the stick back and get into a mush. Yeah. And the landings are. Uh, almost like a land plane in a sense. You, you come in and hold the stick back and you're down and it's quite the machine. That's a rush, it's fun. Who wouldn't like to pull up out of the water right next to your campsite? Once on land, it's like your favorite campsite in the woods with good food and great company. A bus ride to the show will cost you only three bucks round trip. No need to worry about your plane. Bill will keep his eye on it for you. Now that I'm retired, it's just something I automatically do. I just really enjoy being here. I enjoy the people that are here. It's like an extended family, really. Ian Twombly, AOPA Live. So if you've never been to the seaplane base, I would encourage you to go out there in 2021. It's an incredible spot. It's nice and cool, and there's the water lapping. Like, there's no PA announcement. There's <laughs> nothing to get in your head. You just sit there and watch seaplanes come in and out. And if you're lucky, uh, they'll give you a ride. A lot of people go for rides out there. So uh, incredible little spot. Oh, yeah, and the year the Mars came in was just unbelievable. <laughs> And there's a lot of camaraderie out there, for sure, too. It's a little slower pace and lots of people just hanging out enjoying seaplanes. So it's really cool. And uh, speaking of people hanging hanging out, Paul, uh, you had a chance to go to a, a pirate party on the North 40, uh, which was, uh, I went to it too one year and it was a lot of fun. So we're out here at Sunset watching this biplane land, but we've got a saying in aviation that the best part of aviation, it's not the hardware, it's the people. And here at AirVenture, as the sun starts to set, the food and the beverages come out and you get to know your fellow pilots at events like this one behind me. Come on, let's take a look. We are having a blast out here, having a party with our Jolly Roger flags. We are hanging out with my favorite people in the world, airplane people. 
What is it about airplane people that make them your favorite people in the world? Because they put up with me talking about airplanes. Oh, and he does, but that's okay. As the food and unspecified beverages flow, everyone on the North 40 becomes a self-certificated expert on whatever comes by. I mean, th this, right? But all bovine biscuits aside, parties like this are a pilot's paradise. Seeing everything fly by is pretty interesting. In addition to the airplane views, there's little pieces of heaven on a paper plate. Tonight, it's smoked pork. <laughs> pork is a wonderful thing. It is a life-changing event when you can eat pork. But if planes and food don't make your red Solo cup overflow, enjoying it with family, blood, or avgas surely will. The best part about coming out here every year even though, you know, I love seeing all these people, but bringing my son out here and letting him see and become one of these crazy airplane people. Yep, it's contagious. The it's the Pirates of the North 40, and these captains know how to party. Everybody's dressed up, everybody's having a good time. This is the best party that I look forward to whenever I, whenever I come out to Oshkosh. The best part of this party is that not only do you get to interact with other people who love aviation, but you also get to engage in conversation and talk to everybody about what interests them, where their background is, what they fly, and all the fun stuff. It's the perfect time of day to be on an airfield. It's beautiful out here. We have awesome people to uh, share experiences with and talk to and just learn all sorts of new things. What's on the menu? Uh, pork, of course. Mm. <laughs> Some have said the pork here is life-changing, but the buffet line feels more like a big family dinner. I've missed only two years since 1996. Wow, that's uh, dedication. Well, my daughter was born on one of them, and I had a job that I couldn't come with the other, and I left that job soon after. <laughs> Good for you. That's getting your life in order. What brings you back to this party every year? Well, I've been a member of this group for over 10 years, so they're my Osh family. And, you know, but Osh wouldn't be Osh without this group. So we are a irreverent bunch of professionals that for one week a year are irreverent children. And we embrace that wholeheartedly. And those connections are what make it mean so much. If it weren't for the people, I wouldn't keep coming back. Because, you know, the airplanes, they look the same. And while they're amazing and I still, like, I get a thrill in my heart every time I hear, like, a B-25 engine fire up, it's still, the people really make it worthwhile. <laughs> so, I love that story so much. I actually put in two different versions of it there, back to back. You may have noticed there was 2015 and then there was 2018. And I didn't realize this, but they actually changed the name of their group based on the lead line to my story. They have all this merch, t-shirts, challenge coins. One guy even has on his Grumman, the Pirates of the North 40, a line I wrote just real quick uh, based on the guy going, Arr! and uh, they turned it into a mini brand. And I am still waiting on my residuals for that, guys. <laughs> I, I think it'll be a long wait, Paul. <laughs> Maybe. Well, you know, I tried to fire up the grill here in the, uh, the studio so I could get the smell of the brats. Uh, but then the smoke alarm went off and, uh, you know, it just didn't work. But, you know, there's, there's a, when you go to Oshkosh, you think of the brats, you think of the fries, you don't think of eating healthy. But one year I gave Paul Moses the assignment. I said, go out and see if you can find some healthy food at uh, Oshkosh. And believe it or not, he did. In many ways, being at Oshkosh is like, well, being at the State Fair. It wouldn't be Wisconsin without lots of brats, cheese curds, and everything else to satisfy your carb-craving protein pack and palate, which brings us to Joe Kinneby. She traveled all the way from the UK and found a treat that made her day. What do you think of the food choice? Much better this year, definitely. 2016, yeah, I struggled. But it's all chips. It was chips, chips, burgers, chips, and it was like, mm. Turns out, Joe isn't alone. She hasn't chased off the chips. They're still hot out of the grease, but if you're vegetarian or vegan, yes, there are options. There's vegetable fried rice and egg rolls on hold. We found veggie burgers on the grill and Zach Wendell burger making what else? A Greek salad. Okay, it's on a stick. 
It starts off with a wedge of iceberg lettuce. You get a whole tomato, purple onion, pepper, big old hunk of feta cheese. Myself, I'm more of a pulled pork guy, maybe a bratwurst here and there, but every now and then, I do try to, well, eat healthy, like a vegetarian, maybe. <laughs> mm. Oh man, that's good. As for Jo, well, she says a heavier meal makes for a long day around here. It's difficult when you're walking around a big event and you've had a big dinner, you don't enjoy it so much. So this is a good option for It's a you. good light option. Yep, leaving plenty of room for, wait for it, ice cream. Paul Moses, AOPA Live. So if you're a vegan and a pilot, which do you tell people about first at a party? <laughs> There's all these little uh, pilotisms that we have within our culture. And a couple years ago, Natasha Stenbach went over to the air show performers hangar and chatted with them about them. Okay, so we're hanging out with Sean D. Tucker, Mike Goulian, Patty Wagstaff, Kirby Chambliss. I want to get to know a different side of you. We're going to have a little bit of fun today. We're going to talk about what you know and how you know you're a pilot. <laughs> Help me complete the sentence. You know you're a pilot when you carry one of these on Absolute, your keychain. Absolutely, and you want to make sure everybody sees it. You carry one of these around. Yeah, that means you're a serious aviation geek, I have to say. Do you have a you know, leather flight jacket? Well, actually, I do have one of those. I have to admit that I probably have four or five and haven't worn one in ten years, probably. So They look cool in your, you know, in your closet. I need to get rid of my leather jackets. I haven't worn a leather jacket in couple years and I must own 15 leather bomber jackets. I have a couple that have been gifts and actually I actually wear one of them. Where do you get recognized most? Taco Bell. Taco no, Bell. <laughs> Are you I know you I know you I know you. Are you Dustin Hoffman? I like uh, it. Yeah. These are great questions. <laughs> a few more questions we have for you and these are again going to be very random. Um, I thought they already were. They are. They, yeah. They've already been pretty random. Now, if you could be any animal, what would you be? A bird. No question. I have a parrot, and he gets me, and I get him. Call sign for you. You have one? Call sign, yeah. Kirby. Now, what is your one guilty airplane pleasure? Can we come back to that? <laughs> we can come back to that, yeah, without a doubt. Wanting to own a jet. I have other guilty pleasures like hummus. Did you ever use, hey, I'm a pilot, as a, a pickup line with your wife? No. My wife's a pilot also, so it probably wouldn't work that well. Uh, first flight with my wife was in a two-seat extra 300L. And I feel so bad because I pulled so hard that her headset fell off. And I didn't know what was going on up there, but I couldn't see her head anymore. I thought I, I blacked her out or something. But she survived, so I made her my wife. That's OK. I've never used the phrase, I'm a pilot to get a date, <laughs> ever. <laughs> and there was this cute cowboy, and he was trying to pick me up, and he goes, so, and what do you do? And I, I said, I'm a pilot, and he goes, you don't look like a pilot, you look like a woman. <laughs> Edit that part. There you have it, some random questions and some very excellent answers. We'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got my remove before flight uh, keychain, although this one has uh, gotten a bit worn. Can't read it anymore. <laughs> I don't have a handheld radio. I got a ham radio. Does that count? I don't know. <laughs> well, if you need a new remove before flight tag or a handheld radio, those are some things you can get at the Fly Mart. Uh, so Tom Horn uh, took a little trip around the Fly Mart a couple years ago to see all of the interesting things you can find. Hi, right, Tom Horn here. You know, one of the big institutions at AirVenture is the fly market, flea market, get it? And you can get anything here, anything to do with aviation, and maybe not even with aviation. Every kind of part for everything. Let's take a look around and see just exactly what you can get in the fly market. We're talking knickknacks. Idaho, 82. Want them? They got them. A metal sign advertising the Mile High Club. A DVD of Sergei Eisenstein's Ivan the Terrible, a broken manifold pressure indicator. Pots and pans of every description. The original air chair, beer not included. At the Honda booth, it's all about lawnmowers. The Fonz, 
Here's that Chevy Nova trunk emblem that fell off your car back in 1972. <laughs> yeah, baby, a chrome-plated snowblower. Mister, you got a 53 Ford with a rusted out taillight? Well, they'll fix it up for you. 105 millimeter artillery casing used. A Navy ceremonial sword. No comment. Reporting from the fly market, Tom Horn, AOPA Live. And fun fact, I don't think Tom's taken that helmet off since. Well, except for the balloon hat I got him in one time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we sure have had a lot of fun at Air Adventure over the years. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm, it's bittersweet because we work long hours. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of work for us when we're there, but it's worth it. I mean, I, I would say so. Uh, you know, I, I, yeah. I miss being there. I, I miss the camaraderie of everything. Uh, and among us and, and our crew and the fellow aviation press, it's, it, I'm, I'm really missing seeing all the people this week. It, it is, and we had mentioned that the, the AOPA live crew, like, like so many folks at Oshkosh, we, we share a house, and <laughs> to just won't remember one year, uh, my wife got up early to make some coffee and breakfast for all of us, and she walked downstairs, and there was Josh, kind of blurry-eyed, working on editing some pieces, and she said, have you been up all night? And he sort of said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the way we roll. <laughs> yeah, there are some long days, but I always learn so much from um, Air Venture every year, and I definitely miss seeing our our crew that hangs out at the AOP Live House, for sure, also. And yeah, and, and Laurie Arnold, the producer and uh, photographer that we bring along, just incredible talent, incredible people. Shout out to them and Eric Brown and, and everyone else that works with us. We miss you guys so much. Oh, oh we do. But although we work really hard, we, we do have fun. And uh, occasionally there's some stuff that makes even all of us laugh. <laughs> But what keeps us going are the wonderful folks that we are privileged to share the sky with. And among them... <laughs> you got that on camera, damn it! Do you need fresh pants? <laughs> okay. All right. I think we should do that again. So uh, those sneak passes, they'll definitely catch you off guard. I've gotten caught off guard before, too. Fortunately, not on camera, but... <laughs> they will get your attention in a hurry. Yeah. Yeah, we don't usually show bloopers, but that was one that we, we just had to, had to share with you. Well, you know, we've uh, got a lot more uh, stories that uh, you can check out on AOPA.org. Just search for our air venture coverages in the past. I mean, we've been doing air venture uh, AOPA live coverage since, oh gosh, 20, 2009, Warren? Some, something like that. It's, it's been quite a while. It goes way back. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of content there that we weren't able to show here uh, just for brevity's sake. But uh, if you have some time this week, dive into it. We'd, we'd love to, to share some of those old stories with you. All of our stuff's there on the website. A lot of it's on YouTube as well. So check it out. And we're real happy that you've spent some time with us this week, even though we're not seeing you at the, the tent or along the flight line. We miss seeing all of the folks that watch AOPA Live and all of our friends at uh, AirVenture, but um, the germs permitting, the virus permitting, we'll be back next year. I sure hope so. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll leave you with one more really cool video. I got uh, asked if I wanted to come with my friend photographer, Jessica Baruta. She had access to the military ramp for the night show, and she was very generous enough to let me tag along as her plus one. Uh, just an incredible experience to see the air show from that perspective, and we got this video out of it. And we'll see you all at OSH 21. And we'll be back here next Thursday.
My name is Terry Carbonell. I live in the Florida Keys on a private airstrip called Tavernero. What I fly is a uh, 182RG. Wild Mama is her name, 614 Whiskey Mike. You know, Sirius XM is just the best product out there. I fly in the mountains a lot and ADS-B is a line of sight. You can't get ADS-B, you have big gaps in the mountains and that's, gosh, when would you want to have good weather is in the mountains. I like to fly low. I've flown across the United States at 1,000 feet AGL because it's, it's all about scenery. You can't always get ADS-B when you're at 1,000 feet, but I always have Sirius XM weather and radio. Sirius XM radio is on 24-7 when I'm in the plane. Sirius XM weather just keeps you out of trouble. It's certainly avoiding bad memories. It's nothing like having reliable weather service in the cockpit.